Welcome to the Connectfulness Practice Podcast. Here, we settle into the murky, tangled, and freaking hard parts of life to restore our relationship with the self so it can ripple out to the people we love, the work we do, and the world around us. If we can't fix what's wrong, then our grandchildren inherit it. In order to fix what's wrong, we have to talk about it. And we can't move that conversation forward if we're not willing to be real about where we are now. We have to push on the edges of what it means to connect. Otherwise, nothing will ever change. I'm your host, Rebecca Wong, and I'm here to guide you through a series of radically honest conversations about what it means to be truly human in all of its messy, beautiful, hilarious, and heartbreaking glory. In our collective effort of looking inward, we're starting to do the outward work to reconnect the world. While these discussions will guide you into the connectfulness practice, this podcast is not meant to be a substitute for the depth of work that you'd encounter with a licensed provider. If something in this episode touches you, reach out. That's where you initiate the ripple that restores relationships. You can learn more about my connectfulness counseling practice and our collective for therapists in private practice at connectfulness.com. Hi, friends. I'm glad you can join me here. I know that right now, for so many of us, the world feels really out of control. Relationships are one of the few areas that we can profoundly have an impact day to day. Unfortunately, in the hardest of times, it's often our relationships that seem the easiest to put off dealing with. But when they're working, it's our relationships that give us baseline comfort that empower us to meet these challenges with clarity. So I encourage you to stay tuned to these episodes, to make sure that you subscribe to my newsletter, and to check out some of the offers that I'll be sharing with you. October 24th and 25th, I will be co-facilitating a two-day online relational boot camp. It's open for couples, individuals, and also for therapists who are training in the relational life model. And beginning November 2020, I will also be teaching my six-week online course called Supporting Your Relational Self. You can learn more about both offerings at connectfulness.com slash offerings. It's also my great hope that these episodes help you on your journey. And it's with such honor and pleasure that I bring you this conversation with Lashonda Sugg, Let's dive right in. I'm here today with LaShonda Sugg. LaShonda is a trauma specializing therapist and a training consultant. Her ability to make complex concepts easy to understand makes her work accessible to most people. Her authenticity and transparency make people want to listen. LaShonda's work helps people move from coping to healing on this journey called life. LaShonda, I am so, so grateful and excited to dive into this conversation with you today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for welcoming me and inviting me. Yeah. So I feel like I should tell our listeners how I found out about you and your work initially. Okay. Um, I am doing the the training with Jan and Rick Drum over at Healing Our Core Issues, which is based on Pia Melody's method. And as I was in one of my recent trainings with them, your name kept coming up. You kept getting quoted and referred to as this consultant that, you know, it just there was so much knowledge and wisdom coming forth from you and you weren't even in the room. And that directed me towards your work. <laughs> Thank you. It's so humbling. I appreciate it so much. Yeah. So I'm so, I'm so excited. I don't know exactly what's going to come forth from today's conversation, but after looking at your work and um, the brief conversation we've had already, I was really hoping today we could talk about this really big topic of generational healing. Mm -hmm. It's so vast that, you know, it's just kind of what's your entry point. I think the first thing that comes to mind when I think about generational healing is that it is possible. And yes. for me, that that was kind of, it, that remains to be this thing that I shout from mountaintops, right? It is possible because so many of us are living out 
uh, generational trauma and we're calling it personality. You know, we're calling it our family traits. That's just how I am. I don't know. I've always been that way. That's just what we do or we don't do those kind of things. So our brain looks for a convenient narrative to wrap around our lived experiences. And I don't like that. Nope. I don't like her. I don't like him. We don't do that. These are all just stories that the brain is grasping for because it's responding to what's happening in our bodies. It's responding to what's happening around us without the context of what's there. And so when I'm working with people, rather clinically, um, I love, love, love working with multi-generational families, Um, but I work with couples and individuals as well. And even when I'm training and consulting, it's this idea that when we are trying to understand another person or ourselves, sometimes we have to look at context that goes before we were born. Yes. And when we only look Look at our lived experiences over the what, 20, 30, 40, 50 years we've been present on this earth, then we are really missing some context for how we've come to be, how we are, and who we are. And I think just letting people know that they can explore that and that they don't have to continue living their life the way they have is one of the most empowering things that I believe you can give a person. You give them choice Mm -hmm. and you give them empowerment and you don't have to steer it. You don't have to mandate it or dictate it. You just give someone an option. I have said to clients on numerous occasions, changing that belief or that worldview or that behavior is like five steps down the line. Where we start today is just knowing that you have that option. And even that can free people up to be like, huh. My listeners will know that this is one of my favorite things to talk about that choice point. Um, I I often bring it back to some of Viktor Frankl's work where he talks about, you know, between the things that happen to us and our reactions to those Mm -hmm. things, we have a choice. Um, And in that choice lies our freedom and our power. And that sounds exactly what you're talking about with this empowerment and this choice point and just coming back to that place where you have a choice. You have a choice. And what I like to help people understand is I completely understand why it feels like you don't because our body is geared towards survival. I always say our brain's top three priorities are to keep us alive, keep us safe and help us avoid pain. Those are our top. You say those one more time. For our Absolutely. Brain's top three priorities, keep you alive, keep you safe and help you avoid pain. And so that safety and that pain avoidance isn't always physical. It's it's emotional. It's social. It's morally. It's all of these safeties that are combined. And so when we are facing a situation, our brain brain and bodies collaborate to do those three things. And so it will automatically move us in a direction that feels like a lack of choice. But when you help people connect to their bodies and understand what their bodies are trying to do, then it's like that you may not be able to stop that automatic thought or that automatic movement or that automatic story. But once you realize what's happening, you can pause it. It's kind of like when the DVR came into our lives, right? We knew like VCRs, we knew um, DVD players, but those were pre recorded. Right. When this DVR is like early came, 2000. Yeah, right? <laughs> You know, you grew up with that. And then when the DVR came, it was like, wait, this is happening live mm-hmm. and I can still impact it instead of the pre recorded. We have these DVRs, y'all. <laughs> like, we can pause, we can stop and go, wait, okay, something has triggered a lack of safety. That's why I'm responding this way, but I have choice. And I just believe that when we really get it, we can start to um, to make change because what Viktor Frankl, I think what rubs people the wrong way, if you will, is they're looking at the very realities of systemic oppression and yes. all of these systems that are in place. And people say, I think some people interpret that as you're not paying attention to the systems that are creating barriers and roadblocks. And I am, I believe we are but we are still saying, and 
we can stop those automatic responses of survival mode and kind of help them work for us. So it definitely is a both and. It's a both and. One of the things that I'm hearing in listening to you right now, and I don't know if this is where you're going, so I want to check in, is one of the places where you begin then to help people understand what their bodies feel like when they get triggered in that lack of safety? Absolutely. 100%. Um, when people come, particularly I'm thinking in the clinical setting, people come with a presenting issue. Mm-hmm. And the reason mainly why I do a free consult before is I want to know, I want to let people know what they're getting into. And what do you tell I, them? Well, what I tell them, I go through, really, I tell them about DART, <laughs> Development <laughs> and Relational Trauma Therapy. That's my lens. So I tell them we have inner children. I tell them the five core practices I'm going to help them build. But ultimately, what I say to them is, I am a root worker. And your issues that you're talking about are leaves on your tree. And there are people who do leaf work. And I have nothing against leaf workers. But if you want to come and you say, get rid of this leaf, get rid of this leaf, I'm not the person for you. But if you are saying, I want to get to the root and heal the root so that when we get rid of that leaf, a healthy one grows in its place, I am the person for you. Longevity, investment, time, effort, money. These are the things that are essential to this healing process. And I want to be as upfront as possible. And when people say, okay, I'm down. When we start working one at one question, constantly interjected, where do you feel that in your body? Oh, I saw a shift pause. What's happening in your body. Mm -hmm. Can you give it a shape, color, or size? Is there a texture with it? And we start building this map essentially of, oh, this is a sensation. And some people are so disconnected from their bodies that that, that, it's like, what are you talking about? And I say, no problem. What does it feel like when you have to go to the bathroom? Do you know that? And they're like, well, yeah. And I say, can you differentiate between you have to urinate and defecate? Yeah. What, what, what color, shape, or size would you give those two separate feelings? I'm all about meeting people where they are. And if you have had a, a, an extensive trauma experience, whether you realize it or not, part of that safety in keeping you, helping you avoid pain is disconnecting you from the pain that happens in your body. So we either go neck up or we dissociate. And and one thing that you just said there, whether you realize it or not, because this, this relates back to the dart work that both of us do, um, is that so often some of the things that have caused so many of us trauma are things that we don't even notice. They have become woven into the fabric of who we think we are and what is quote unquote normal, that there are so many things we don't look to as these very pivotal, uh, like touchstones. If I'm, I practice, I do EMDR as well. So we talk about these touchstone moments or, you know, going back to these root moments. And that's something else to tell people. You're going to have some immediate thoughts when I talk about growing up in your world? What was it like being you? What was it like growing up being you is a question I ask. And they will come at some of these highlight moments, right? And they'd be like, well, when I was six and I go, pause, let's go back. (laughs) (laughs) What do you know about your parents' relationship when your mom was pregnant? And it's like, what? And again, this is just how you would have heard it, but what you've heard informs who you think you are. Right, right. And so it's these moments of, we get to some moments where people are like, I haven't thought of that in 30 years. And they, they kind of, you know, minimize in that. And so I just kind of keep asking these questions, the relationship, like with your, with your siblings. I love when people have siblings and I go, what, what were all of your roles? What, what role did you fit in? Every person is assigned a role in their family. Mm -hmm. And it's not like they sit around the kitchen table and you get to roll a dice or pick a card or you get to say what role you want. Nope. Whatever need is in the family at the time to keep it functioning, which doesn't mean it's functional. That's the role we play. And so helping people to just start, I mean, just doing, I do kind of a mini, what we call debriefing, this kind of moment with every client. And you can just start to see when, when they start to like, that matters, that matters. Yeah. It's so Big. I I know for me, I, I, we were saying this before we started recording today. 
um, in my own personal work, I think I've done a lot of my work. I've done a lot of these intensive debriefs. I've done a lot of the start work. Um, and yet every time I'm in a training and we go through the work a little more, I, it just more and more pops up. And then I'm starting to notice as I come out of those moments throughout my life, there's just more moments as I get more equipped in this work where I'm just doing it on my own a little bit more. Yes, <laughs> Rebecca, yes. What I love about the model and what I also try to tell people is my my goal is to work myself out of a job yeah. with every single client. And so I want those experiences of healing to come, but I also want to tell people what I'm doing, what we're looking for, how to do these things yourself. I'm with you. I 100% know that this is a life work. Yes. And I... Up until, well, well, we don't know about 2020, so probably not. But up until now, since I started DART, I do an intensive a year for myself. For yourself. And it, I love we that. will never run out of material. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will, we will, ne- I will never run out of things. But what, like you said, there are moments when stuff comes up and then I have to pause and check in. Okay. All right, y'all. Who, who is it? Who needs something from me right now? And what's also helping me, particularly with the material and doing the work, is I am working on my book. Um, and you know, what's your I've book known, about? I know I've had a I've had books in me for a really long time since I was like a teenager. So I've known this, but it's always been it felt non practical. Like, what? Who has time to sit down and write a book, right? Well, as I do more and more work, I realize it's one of those like literally it, it's trying to leap out of me. I uh, I have to do time. that. So, to the best of my ability to describe my vision, still in the early works, it will be a combination of memoir and self help. And so what that means for me, at least right now, as I'm conceptualizing it, is there are these stories that I tell from a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that happened in my life. And at the end of that is, and here's the lesson it taught me. Mm. Then there's, and here's how that lesson played out throughout my life. And then this aspect of what lessons are playing out in your life? So if I'm hearing this correct, you know, one of the, there's many reasons I love doing this work. And one of the things about it is as you do these intensives, you're not doing them alone. You're doing them with others in collective. And so you're bearing witness to each other's work and it's touching you. Yes. And so as you're talking about what you're writing, you're sharing your own work. You're sharing your own awareness points. You're sharing the growth that has happened inside of you, which I just want to acknowledge how hard that is to do. Um, super hard. It, super hard. Like I'm, I'm also very aware that there's this book that keeps trying to want to percolate and come through me. And yet there are parts of my story that I still don't have straight enough that I still am sitting with yeah. and they're not ready yet. Yeah. So, um, so I just want to acknowledge first that piece of your work, how that, you. that's ready to come through. And then the other piece is that in sharing those stories, we make the work more accessible because other people can witness it. And yeah. there's something in that that helps them see themselves. It is the power of the witness, like yes. you just expressed, is so tremendously uh, spiritual. <laughs> it, yeah. it is so amazing to, you know, you go into these intensives and the, the chair we do the work, um, me, and my, me and my intensive sisters, we call it that damn chair. <laughs> got to sit in that damn chair. That's what we call it. And, um, and so you sit in the chair and you do your work, but the power of witnessing someone doing their work. And, and this is, I've had a couple of people say this to me that has enhanced something I've been experiencing, but I now have better words for what happens is you don't just witness the work. You witness those inner children. And what happens is I, I've had a lot of people, so I, so part of the writing the book is I'm part of a think uh, organization called Women Writing for a Change here in Cincinnati, which is a fantastic uh, organization for every level of writer. There's community and there's accountability and all of that. But what happens is I have people after I'll read a piece will say, I just want to give that little girl a hug. I just want to love on her and they talk to her. So one, I am giving the exposure to my children that they always needed and deserved, but didn't get. 
people to validate them and affirm them and love on them. And that is amazing. And then I've had people not within the writing circle, but I talk about, I call my inner children, my littles, um, which differentiates them from the children I've had, I raise. And I've had more than one person say, my little wanted to connect with your little. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, and and that's what the beauty of this work does when we're able to witness is we're able to bring forth community to these parts of ourselves that oftentimes feel isolated and alone and rejected and disappointed and fearful. And so we, we surround them with people who want to nurture them being a parent of multiple children, when you find a trusted babysitter, like literally someone that you can trust to watch your children while you go out and know that they'll be safe and cared for and all of that, that as a parent, that is like, whoo, that is it. Imagine finding that for your inner children. It's so big. People you can trust with your littles. And what that means practically is when I'm having a temper tantrum as a fully grown adult because one of my littles is afraid or thinking that someone's going to disconnect from us. And I have a person I can call to love on that part of me without judging me because I'm a full grown adult having a tantrum or without trying to fix it or without trying to solve it or any of that. You just have someone that can like, love on that part of you. Oh my goodness. So my community is expanding and I love that other people's community expands, even if it's just the people who are in the intensives. And as a person who going forward, so Rick is amazing. And he's also like, and I'm pretty much done with these intensives, especially doing all of them. (laughs) So uh, that mantle and that honor is being passed to me um, in a lot of ways. So being able to hold the space for these intensives is so uh, amazingly uh, sacred and gratifying and humbling. But even though I'm walking people through the journey, I also yeah you're get still going something through from yeah. the journey, and I'm getting something through with it. And yeah, it's it's yeah. amazing. I think maybe just for our listeners' sake, because not everybody has experienced one of these intensives that we're talking mm-hmm. about. I want to go backwards a little bit. Um, And I know I've talked about them in the past. I've had Jen on the show. Um, We've talked about uh, the episode I did with Jen Bergstrom. We talked about these intensives a little bit. Um, So I I think we we should just take a step backwards and talk about what these intensives are. Because um, other than life changing, which like I can't emphasize enough. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, I don't know that they're life changing. I think that they change how you live your life. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, the way I, along that same line, how I kind of frame it is they don't help you go on to be a better person. They help you discover the person you were always meant to be. Mm -hmm. And that is this life shifting uh, yeah. experience uh, that allows you to connect to what can be because what always has been, we just didn't know it. You just didn't know it. Yeah. 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 So, so let's, let's talk about it for a minute. Let's, let's talk about the setup for these intensives, what people come into them kind of to experience. Yeah. Um, there's three fa- there's four phases of the work really. Um, and Maybe we'll we'll also just hit on the, the little the little skills that they learn throughout the um, the core practices. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, these intensives are a combination of education, like psychoeducation, learning, uh, skill development, and building, and then this experiential component that I can only describe as VR meets time travel. That's the first thing I said after I experienced one of them. And so um, they're done in groups, three or four participants um, and a facilitator. And uh, when space (laughs) and non-COVID related issues are there, sometimes a a support person and and a witness. And so uh, the participants are coming in to get all of those components together. And where we start is we help people understand the five core practices 
to kind of living a cultivating your functional adult, living a healthy life. Yeah. And just quickly, those five practices are loving yourself by understanding your inherent worth and value, protecting yourself by setting and maintaining functional boundaries, knowing yourself and embracing your humanity. Uh, taking care of yourself by building a healthy interdependence and moderating yourself, allowing joy and play to be a part of your life while being contained enough not to offend others. And so we kind of talk about where, like what that looks like practically and that the work is helping to build that. We go through one phase called the debriefing. The debriefing is essentially uh, taking time. What was it like growing up being you? Um, Each person who's doing their work um, has their eyes closed um, because our brain is so powerful, um, yet it doesn't know the difference between memory, reality, and imagination. Hmm. And so our brain, whatever we think on, our brain activates towards that. And so when with our eyes closed and when we say, you know, go back to your childhood home, you would be amazed at how you can smell smells and feel yes. temperatures and taste taste. I mean, because that is how powerful our brain is in activating and mobilizing our bodies to the experience it is envisioning. So through this experience, we go through the, the debriefing, which is essentially what was it like growing up being you? And we have some pointed questions that we may ask, but the point is we just really want to get this overview of these lived experiences. And during the debriefing process, very often um, the facilitator is able to pick up on some some places that may have uh, left a wound. All of us have wounds. None of us escape childhood with wounds. But some of those wounds are so profound that they leave imprints. And when I'm doing the intensive, I'm looking for imprinting moments. And so once you've done the uh, debriefing, uh, these take place on separate days, uh, usually Friday, Saturday, Sunday. On the next day, we come back together and collaboration between the facilitator and participant to identify which of these moment or two would that person like to go back and revisit. When we go back, this is the inner child work. We are going back to that moment Interestingly, not in the midst of what happened, because no matter how good the work is, we can't go back and change the things that have happened, but we can um, change how we view that experience. And so we go back as ourselves in our adult lives back to talk to and make connection with that, that child who experienced that. The incident has passed and often we enter that experience where that young person is left there having that experience they're having afterwards. And as an adult, we go back to them and we become the adult they never had, but they always needed. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we get to reparent. We get to come and bring love and unconditional acceptance and nurturing and affirmation. And it, it, listen, if this is sounding crazy to y'all, I know. I know, but let me tell you, it is so real and so powerful when that little child sees us. And sometimes they're like, "Mm -mm, I don't know you. I don't trust you. Who are you? And sometimes they give you the, it's about time. Look, where have you been? Where have you been? I've been crying (laughs) out to you all these years and we make connection with them um, and offer them the opportunity to come in our heart and be with us in a way that they can communicate with us often. And so that's our inner child work. And then our final stage is um, what we call standing in our truth or feelings reduction. And this is so powerful, y'all. This is when we get to- You call this the rightful assignment of responsibility, right? This, yes, this is all about it. None of this work is ever about blame or shame, but it is always about the rightful assignment of responsibility. Because when we do not rightly assign the responsibility to the things that have happened in our lives, we either walk around carrying the weight of that on ourselves, our lives, or we're constantly trying to assign it to other people. So when I'm working with couples Mm -hmm. and they're arguing and fighting and he never pays attention to me, she's always bossy. I go, pause. 
I'll give the 20 to 30 percent to your partner. But where does this other 70 to 80 percent belong? Yeah. It's not on them. So I, when we go, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just I'm thinking there's there's a couple in my caseload. Something huge came up and it wasn't making sense in the moment. And one of the partners said something like, I'm carrying this burden and it's not mine. And I just asked them, I said, close your eyes. How old do you feel? They said about seven. That's not, that, that's older than yes. this moment in your marriage. Mm-hmm. That, that is exactly it. Our current experiences. Mm-hmm. So something I can say is we are constantly having current interactions with yes. historical experiences. And so all of that weight is there. So what the standing in your truth um, feelings reduction work does is it allows us to have an experience with the person that either offended us, didn't protect us, you know, whoever was in that, that adult, or sometimes it's another similar age child who was in that thing that we did with the inner child work, the offender. And we have a one-way conversation with them. And the beautiful thing is they're sitting as they were then, not as they are now. That gets a lot of people hung up. Sometimes our parents who were well-intentioned, you know, people like to say they did the best they could. Sometimes they actually don't. (laughs) But even though they were well-intentioned, well, 30 years has passed and you know what? They had their quote unquote, come to Jesus moment. They've changed and they've apologized. And, And so when we get to this work, it's hard for people to kind of rightly assign because they're thinking about the person their parent is now. And the beauty of this is it's not this refined parent that has done their work and has apologized. It's the parent at the time of Mm -hmm. when this happened. And so they're there and we allow our inner children to stand behind us because we are there to protect them. And what we're doing is we're telling this person that offended us as they were at the time, what the impact of their action or inaction, their words or lack of words have had on us as we were that child and how that showed up throughout their lives. And the most important part of this is whatever we are carrying of theirs, their rage, their Their anger, pain, their sadness, their their shame, their fear, their pain. Yeah. All of that, especially shame, all that stuff that we're carrying of theirs, we get to give it back. as a gift. Right. And because it's theirs. And that's the thing. This is not, you take it back, you so-and-so and so-and-so. No, no, this is not in anger. This is not in revenge. This is in justice. Because this is yours, you take it. And sometimes what happens in our lives, and man, is this true in my life. Sometimes we carry so much of other people's stuff that they don't feel what they need to feel in order to heal. You can't heal what you can't feel. And if I'm carrying someone's pain and shame and they're not, then they don't think they have anything to work on. They don't have any pain to address because I'm carrying it all. So when I give it back, I am giving them what they need to to open the opportunity for them to move into healing for Mm -hmm. themselves. And we get to do that. And our littles, our children, our inner children get to witness it. And they then get to free themselves up and have the experiences that they couldn't have because of what they were carrying and they get to have. And that's where we start opening our lives to more joy. That's where we start to be, have more vitality. That's where things start to feel safer. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought, as I was talking, when I call the debrief, we also call that getting our story straight. We know the details, y'all. We know the story sometimes. <laughs> we remember the last retelling <laughs> of it. Our, that's how our memory works. But we, we, we know the story. But sometimes we say mm-hmm. we rearrange furniture. Sometimes it's just one statement or question that a person can ask that then shifts. And it's like, I never thought of it that way. And to be clear, the power of the witness, I had a client I was going to, I was encouraging to do an intensive And once we, her reluctance, once we got down to her reluctance, it was, she didn't want a whole bunch of people sitting around analyzing her and giving her feedback. And I said, 
ah, good point. So I want to make it clear that the power of the witness is to have someone bear witness to yeah. your transformation. And the feedback that's given isn't you should have or you could have and now you need to, but it's when I heard you say that, it reminded me of this and about that I feel this way. And it allows you to realize that what felt like this very isolating, painful experience is really more abundant than we know. And it helps us to foster that community. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful body of work that um, I have such gratitude. I call her Grandma Pia. Um, <laughs> you know, that Pia Melody, uh, her work is so valuable. And I have such tremendous gratitude for I call Mama Jan and Daddy Rick for, <laughs> you know, expanding this and making it um, yeah. so accessible. Yeah. I, I have a million questions to, to, to kind of pile on and I want to, I want to um, be a little contained and moderate them, you know, and not get too effusive <laughs> here, but I also wanted to share a small story about my own work. If that's okay. I, yes. I had this really interesting moment and it wasn't until doing like additional work that it all made sense for me. When I did my first intensive, the hardest point for me was opening my eyes back up and noticing my witnesses. And what I'm realizing later as I do the work is that knowing myself was one of the injuries that I kind of have really been sitting with, um, knowing my own reality. And so being witnessed was so incredibly hard because it actually brought it home. You know, like that, that was just a piece of my own work and my own healing that I'm coming to terms with and understanding and integrating. But I wanted to bring that in here too, because I, I realized that that was one of the reasons I had so much trouble with this was that my reality was, was always questioned, was always denied. And so to actually see people witnessing it, that gift, right, was also the, 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 the difficulty of that gift, of me accepting that gift was part of my healing. Absolutely. And, and to that point, um, mm. shame so much shame I've experienced in my life, so much shame. And so for me, there was one point where during my intensive, I was asked to just look at each Mm. of the witnesses, just look at them and not avert my gaze and, and allow myself to see them seeing me. And it was one of the most vulnerable, terrifying things that I've done, but also one of the most healing because with yeah. shame, we hide. The whole premise is hide it. And when I was able to see people seeing me fully emotionally naked in the way that I was, it was so healing. The thing about it is you leave. And I don't want to create this like this sense of then you stand up and boom, you're like, I'm changed. Why? You know, no, that that's, that's not how it happens. Right. Like any other healing, it's this gradual point. And after my first intensive, this is what I remember. I remember being, um, I had young, uh, they would have been under, were they a year? Yeah, I have twins. Um, and so I, I started DART when I was in grad school. I had my twins when I was in grad school, this whole thing. And I was sitting in my bed with the mirror was in front of me. And at one point, maybe three or four days after the intensive, um, I looked across my room, which mean I had to look past the mirror and then at something else. And that's when it hit me. I had looked in the mirror and for the first time in my life that I could remember, I did not have a self-deprecating thought. And I paused and it was like, wait. And then I look back to the mirror because before that point, I could look in the mirror to make sure my hair was okay. Do I have broccoli in my teeth? I could look for certain things, but I did not look in the mirror at myself because I had that much shame. And when I was able to bring my gaze back to the mirror and there was not this overwhelming sense of shame, I was like, what is happening? And the way I phrased it was, I was no longer swimming in the Mm -hmm. waters of shame. 
that I my head had come up for air. And it is a continuous work. I'm not saying I just jumped right out of that water, but my head was above and I was able to literally look at myself without that experience. That's how without I Without having working. to see yourself and through the lens of shame. Like that was that was the thing. That was yes. the veil that was lifted. Yeah. It was because that shame mm-hmm. was not mine. It was like yeah. a cataract. You know, it's just this filmy way that you look at life until you have the cataract removed. You can see, but you're not seeing clearly. And I only saw myself through the lens of my sexual abuse, through my feelings of abandonment, through the shame I was carrying of other people's, through feelings of unwantedness. That's how I saw myself. And for the first time ever, I looked and I saw Shonda in that mirror. And I can say that now, several years into this journey, when I look in the mirror, I go, damn, girl, you are beautiful. You are amazing. And it's not arrogance. It's just truth. And I'm talking to every one of those littles who spent their whole lives thinking the opposite. And it is I mean, this this to me feels like liberation. Beyond anything else that, you know, like One, this, yes. we, we can talk about all the different forms of systemic oppression that are upon all of us. And this is the place where, I mean, we have, we have power over systems in some ways, but this is the place where I think we hold the most power. And, and I, I think it, it is, um, yes. these things are combined. When I think about the racial equity work and just social justice work and anti, anti-oppression anti work that I do personally, individually, as well as with people, part of that is being able to see yourself not through yes. the lens of the system. One of my more recent journeys, like over the last couple of weeks, I, I do a lot of stuff. And one of them is a group called Courage to Connect, where we create brave space to talk about racism and what that means and all of that stuff. And one of the questions that we were asked in this group was, um, why does the world need mm. you to exist? And when I first was asked that question, I'm like, got it. Been thinking about this. I know the answer. It's, you know, because I have something the world needs because, because I am here to help. And, and immediately it was like, okay, that was, that was a quick answer. And I began to just say, all right, what identities do I hold that make that true? Then I start to think about, well, one, I'm an Enneagram too. I don't know if people follow the Enneagram, but I'm a textbook too, the helper. Um, because in my life, I realized that I, people would choose me because I didn't see my value. So I had to make people choose me by being an asset and value to them. So Shonda became a helper. She could, she, I could figure out somebody's need before they knew they had it and meet it so that they never knew they actually had it. I considered that at one point my superpower. I now realize that was my trauma response, but okay. So I, I became a helper and I am a woman and I am a black woman. And most people would identify me as Christian, Christian, black woman. Well, all we do is help, right? Our whole identity is in service too. Someone taught me that. So I learned to ask the question, who taught me that? Where did I learn that? And my, my new question, which is so powerful for me is, and who is benefiting from me believing that about myself? It's not that I'm not a, I am who I am. But as I just took that one question and I yelled at them and I'm like, you sent me into an existential crisis just with this one question. <laughs> but it's okay. Now that I'm thinking about it, there, there are systems at play that have told me who I am and who I'm not, what I can do and what I can't do. And I have drank so much of that Kool-Aid that yeah. I need to now pause. Why can't I do that? Because patriarchy told me I couldn't. Why am I not that? Because the white supremacy told me I'm not. And so when I'm able to pull back three steps and just look, then I say, okay, they don't get to define that for me. The challenge is figuring out how that's woven into so much of my life, which is why I have now am exploring the differences between a healer, a helper, mm. and a caretaker. And for me, those three things are different. 
And I am a healer, but I think about how many times I take on the role of caretaker. And when we think caretaker, we think parent, you know, whatever, right? We have these responsibilities, but I want people to just actually think about care, the, the name caretaker. Mm-hmm. It goes back to what we just said. I've taken on so much of other people's stuff and taken care of it that they haven't been empowered to take care of it themselves. As a healer, I don't have to take that on. I have to empower them to know they can. I can Sherpa. I can guide. I can let them know where the pitfalls might be. I make a really good GPS. This goes right Back but to the beginning of our conversation where you were talking about how generation is generational healing is possible. And that's yes. the most empowering gift is that you can help to give people that choice. That it, yeah. it's full circle. I can't heal it for you, but I can tell you it's possible and I can be there with you as you heal. But this notion that I can take Mm-mm. those cares and those things and do anything with it. It's, yeah. a fa- it's false. And I don't want to do that to my children, the generations going forward. And I don't want to hold on to these injustices that have happened to my life to prevent those from before me from healing. So part of generational trauma, I have a t-shirt line and one of my church shirts say generational trauma stops here. And I wear it proudly Because one small decision and choice that I make with my children can stop a pattern that goes forth seven to 10 generations. And one small thing that I cannot do within myself can kind of stop that, that cycle that has been present for seven generations behind me. When we realize we, in fact, do have that much power, it is amazing. And we can just, we can see ourselves from that perspective instead of the perspective that tells us what we can and cannot do and how we can and cannot exist. It is. is, This this is, this is the everything, this moment right here where we, where we notice that power to, um, to pass forward and heal backwards. Yeah. Yes. Talk to us a little yes. bit about your work, your generational work with multi-generational families, because this, um, I know, is, is one of your sweet spots. And, you know, as I, as a listener listening to you, um, it's, a, it's a place where my curiosity is completely piqued, um, because it feels to me that it's the place where so much of this empowerment lives. Like, when you can work with multiple generations in a room simultaneously, I I can only imagine what can be accomplished. So much. I, it, it, it is my, I am going to phase. Eventually this will be all the work that I do. And I'm just saying heads up. It will at some point be retreat style on some beach where you can come with your whole family for a week. We're going to get it together and y'all going to have fun. Um, But the point for me is when I, when you work with an individual, you're working with that individual through their particular lens of what's happening in their relationships. When you work with a couple, you're working with both of those lenses, which is great, but it doesn't bring into account the the family systems and social structures that have gotten them there. I I guess I'll tell you why, how this came to be. When I first started my career as a therapist, which has only been a couple of years, I, my husband says, you've been a therapist all your life. Aren't you glad you're getting paid for it now? I started when I was four. It's true. So I was that girl four is the magic age. We'll have to talk (laughs) offline. So, um, so I was working with a couple and things were going very well. Um, again, dark has been a foundation for me because I, I did the work while I was in grad school. So we're coming from this lens. Things are going really well. The couple comes to me one day and says, this is going amazing. Can we bring our parents? And I'm like, um, sure. Uh So Rick Butts, who is part of Healing Our Core Issues Institute founder? Uh, he he is mm-hmm. my clinical supervisor. Okay, and he goes, oh, whew, okay. Well, I'm so glad we got supervision that day. You know, that's going to be. You know, families are rough. You know, and you'll be coming in. I'm like, okay. I had that couple and both sets of their parents. And you're you're not talking about room. empty and chair parents, normal. like parents that are coming in through the dart work. No, no, I'm talking legit. <laughs> parents. There were five people in this room. One parent was on the phone because they live, he couldn't make it and he was out of state. So you have all of these dynamics. And I came in and it was amazing. 
I mean, there were so I the what I what invigorates me the most is how many balls are yep. up in the air that I got to keep up, and I love it. So that's one thing that I really enjoy. What is fascinating though is they all yeah. are bringing their full history, and so where I am extremely gifted, um, in working with multi generational families, is having three to six people in a space, and they all leave feeling like they've had individual therapy and they mm-hmm. understand the whole better to meet each person's need. And so I went through this process of, and, and what I always tell people always is whatever you think you're talking about, you're not talking about. So this is your time and money. Do we want to spend it on the rice, the backpack, the, whatever you think you're talking about, or do we want to go root. to what it's really about? And we were able to dive to the root. And when they began to understand oh, you're a convenient narrative for the abandonment that I feel when this, this, and this happens. Oh, that all of this is happening. So when we were able to do that, I then go to my supervision and Rick is ready for me to be wore out. And I was like on a high and he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> so he, he just was like, First of all, I hate that kind of work. Uh, most people do, but you literally, it, it brought life. You know, you mm-hmm. seem so energized. It brought life. And so I've taken that. The beauty of it is I, when I'm doing a, fa- a multi generational family, we start with the oldest person uh-huh. and we do that, 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 um, that mini debriefing, that mini getting your story straight. I want everyone in the family to hear this person's perspective of growing up. And what I say is, I'm sure you've heard these stories before. I'm inviting you to listen to this person tell their story as if they were a stranger that you were just trying to get to know. And then I ask those questions and that, that person, whether it's the parent or a grandparent, aunt, whoever it is, the oldest person, and they start to tell, and I'm asking those questions about, so what was, what was the role of your siblings in your family and what role did you take? And da, 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 da. And then I moved to the next oldest and the next oldest by the time. And that is, that's a whole session. And by the time we're done, yes. work has been done. People, Cause then I will say, so what did you hear that was different? Like, I always knew that you know, you were the oldest of five. I didn't realize that you had to take care of all your siblings. I didn't realize the impact when your dad died, da, da, da. And so then, and, and part of what also I do know makes me effective is I'm a very good storyteller. I weave a good story. So I take the data that they give me and then I weave a generational mm. story for them. And I begin to say, so what makes sense to me, and you all let me know if this feels true for you, is growing up, Grandma, when you, when your siblings got in trouble, your responsibility was to keep them out of trouble so you would get in trouble. So even as a child, you began to realize that your safety and survival depended on having control. And I'm wondering how, as you had your own children and you still had this young child in you that needed to have control, mom, you felt burdened by your mom's attempts to control Start and to so weave, you just it weave together. this story. And, and, and again, I'm not making any of it up and I'm checking in, does this feel real? But they're able to see themselves through this lens. So I say, you don't bump heads. The lens bump of heads. how they all affect and each I, other. It, it's all, it, every piece is connected Right, because to my every story relays back, and, like the, the reason that my story is my story, the reason that your story is your story has a lot to do with the people that were our caretakers, our guardians, our parents, and how, how they raised us. Like absolutely. what was their lens while they were raising us? Yeah. How did they, how did their body have to keep them alive, safe and help them avoid pain? And so I consider a template, the worldviews, the beliefs and the behaviors that a person develops mm-hmm. growing up in their family system and structures. And so then while we're working with this family, then you have the spouse of someone. And I say, now you had a completely different template, but do you understand? I understand that a little more, of course. And here's the thing. Every good story needs a hero and every good story needs a villain. What happens if we take that out of the family? Take out the hero and take out the villain. What if we say, what if we take out the hero? What if we take out the villain and you actually just see each other 
for who you are. That is very effective. I also do a process with, and and to be fair, I, it's not, um, sometimes children come with this, but I yep. generally work 14 and up. I'm talking teenage children. And when we are able, I do a thing called reintroductions. Let's do a reintroduction because I feel like, you know, 17 year old child, you know, you're interacting with mom. Like she's still the mom she was at that four year old wound. And mom, I have a feeling you're interacting with this teenager like they were when they were eight years old and couldn't do it themselves. What if you reintroduced yourselves to each other as you are now? And as they begin to do that, they're, they just yeah. like, yeah, I don't see you as you are mm-hmm. right now. I, I am engaging with you based on this historical perspective. And so all of these things, when you can get with a whole family, the reason I know I love it so much is because it's not the responsibility of the one person who's decided to do their work to then go around and do this. You give me everybody at one time. And then what I get is people are like, okay, so can I bring this? You can bring whoever you want to. I'm talking bring them all and and let's do it because how you've been, I know even from my story, my I have a sister who's 14 years older than me and she totally has viewed viewed my life at one point as if, oh, you know, I I had everything she didn't. And it's like, no, but she couldn't get past that lens. Now that we are closer and we're able to talk, we realize that the same wounded yeah. mother raised us both, first of all. And we have these perspectives and perceptions. So now we can engage differently because we have gotten the collective story right. And we can go back to my grandmother and my great-great-grandmother and say, hey, this is the lineage that has come to us both. What do we want to do about it? And so when I'm able to do that, one of the most devastating for me experiences, though, it's when I, it's, this happens a lot with siblings. It's when we get those siblings to that point and they realize how much yeah. time they lost over a misunderstanding. And it breaks their heart, it breaks mine because their conflict wasn't with each other, it was with the historical trauma that was manifesting yep. in both of their lives. And, and so I, I am grateful that I've been able to help unite families to re, try to recoup some of that time and engage in ways that are healthy and be around each other's kids and do all of those things that they hadn't been doing because I rightly assign the blame to the trauma. Not that the right there, that's huge, right? The, that the, the trauma is where the blame goes. It's the trauma. It doesn't belong to a person or any person. It's the trauma. No. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. LaShonda, this, this is huge and it's so big. And I, I, I'm so grateful for your presence and your work in the world. And I think I could stay in conversation with you for days to learn more about it. So maybe will you come back? I would be honored to come back. Thank you so much. Can you You just let our listeners know I'll include links below, but let our listeners know where they can find you and your t-shirts as well. Cause I know I want one of those. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, um, my website is a one-stop shop for everything about me, www.thelaborsoflove.com. From there, all of my social media, your is podcast. There. Um, if you go to the shop, Yes. Um, my podcast, the labors of love podcast, anywhere you get your podcast. Um, I bring on guests and ask them what's their labor of love and how that shows up in the world. Um, the shirts are under the shop on my website. I have one that says hope dealer, one that says, uh, cope with a strike through and then heal. So we've coped for a long time, y'all. It's time to heal. And then generational trauma stops here. Um, I have a book coming out. This is not the book I was referencing, um, but I'm an author in an anthology called mm. The Heart of a Therapist. Um, and you can pre-order that book on my website as well. And then we have a YouTube channel. Every week I do uh, a short Therapy Thursday video around whatever, mental health relationships, just kind of these snippets to kind of get you through your week. And you can subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, through the website as well. So, so much. You are so welcome. Having you back on the show. I can't wait. Dear listener, I hope you got a lot out of today's conversation. 
and I'm wondering, are you ready to really unpack the habits that haven't been working and replace them with strategies that will change the course of your relationship to yourself, to your partner, and to the world? I invite you to join me for one of two or both events online. October 24th and 25th of 2020, I'll be co-facilitating an Essential Skills Relationship Boot Camp. It's open to individuals, to couples, and also to therapist training in the relational life model. And then, November 2020, we begin another section of my six-week online Supporting Your Relational Self course. Go to connectfulness.com slash offerings to learn more and register for these events. And I want to remind you, while these episodes will guide you into the connectfulness practice, this podcast is not meant to be a substitute for the depth of work that you'd encounter with a licensed provider. If something in this episode touches you, reach out. That's where you initiate the ripple that restores relationships. Listeners often ask how they can support the ongoing production of the Connectfulness Practice podcast. Truly, the very best way that you can is simply to subscribe and rate the show on your favorite podcasting platform and hop on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. It also always helps when you share episodes that you love with your friends and following. I want to express deep gratitude for Sarah and Chris Ferris, the musicians behind the beautiful soundtrack for the Connectfulness Practice podcast, which was recorded and mixed at Kidney Stone Studio. This podcast is produced by me, Rebecca Wong, and copyrighted by Connectfulness Counseling. Talk to you again soon.